Okay, good afternoon everybody. I see we have uh, shrinked a number a bit, but nonetheless, um, I think for the first part of our today's session, uh, this will be quite useful anyway. As usual, let us start um, that you give me a short agree sign that you can hear me properly, see me, that everything is working. Okay, Lisa, you have raised your hand by accident, I guess. Uh, if not, just do it again. Uh, yeah, remove the agree uh, agreement sign. Uh, yes, as we are in uh, class on in political science, I think we cannot just go over that what um, happened or like which was decided last night. I think every one of you has uh, followed up the news anyways about the election in the United States of America. And I would like uh, to start our session today, not with a topic uh, about which Marek is going to talk a bit later on, but to give us uh, a fi 15 minutes uh, time to exchange some information and opinion. And my idea is uh, not to follow up with um, Donald Trump blaming, which uh, was part of actually every liberal uh, news of the last uh, six months, but having a look a little more analytical to that, what we think and what we can maybe um, understand from that decision, which was quite a surprise for everyone in the United States and even here in Marburg uh, and discussion panels um, the academic world is shocked by both shocked and surprised. So what I'm going to do, and this is the experience part of that, I will promote every one of you to moderator function, which means that everyone of you should activate his or her camera and uh, we can start speaking freely. I would suggest uh, that we just give it a try. It's a bit a thing of like uh, communicating uh, through this tool, but there are experiences that it worked. We can also, uh, when we see that a lot of people wanna say something, you can just raise your hand and I'm moderating this in the, with these regards. So um, this is something which I uh, usually try a little later on, as I told you, but uh, given the incident and new uh, development or uh, changes in the United States, I think uh, having a proper debate about that, what happened uh, is worth. And for sure, this part of our debate will not be part of any recording and anything what I'm putting online. So please, every one of you um, activate the video and we will see whether this works. Okay, is there anyone who, who still wanna add something which has not been said? And just raise your hand and if not um, I end this for now and I'm keen to hand over to uh, Mareike who is uh, speaking today on the topic for which uh, everyone has uh, read the text of so modernization theory and its critics um, so from my side as usual I will silence myself and leave it to Mare Mareike and uh, I will move you all back to normal participants also to um, to have a broadband that is uh, not overwhelmed uh, by too many uh, video connections. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Sebastian and Lisa, maybe you can deactivate your webcams as well. That would be great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for talking about the election. I think that's a very, uh, very good to talk about it. And uh, I hope my topic now doesn't seem dull in comparison. Um, I hope you can e hear me all. Um, if there's any technical issue, just let me know. Also, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know uh, right away. You can either write them in the chat or just raise your hand and then we can talk about it. And I don't know 
know whether you have not again that you have the option on our of the presentation. You can see that um, possibly that that's more um, interesting for you then you won't see the chat anymore. Um, and otherwise, uh, my topic today is uh, modernization uh, theory and its critiques. And um, I just want to briefly tell you what we're going to talk about today. So I will just start with some theoretical background and then um, go over the various approaches you have also read about in the text for this week. Then we will do a little bit of group work because I would very much like to um, discuss with you and have you in groups discuss what are possible um, critiques to these approaches to the theory that you can see um, from either reading, reading the text but also from the presentation. And uh, then we will bring all the points of critique together. Um, and after this, I would like to talk to you a little bit about modernization theory after 1990 because it was revived again uh, later on in the 20th century. Um, then I will just give you a quick summary. And in the end, I have prepared a little quiz. Um, I don't want to scare you off, um, so please don't leave after the summary. Um, it's just uh, six questions which should help you to um, estimate whether you understand the topic because in the coming sessions we are going to talk about different theories which are also connected to this one. Um, so it's, it's important to me that first of all I explained it to you so that you can understand and also that um, we can talk about certain issues um, in case you didn't understand them. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Names won't be displayed. So it's not a test in the sense that you will see um, who did get the correct answer or not, but it will just show um, a distribution of who answered which uh, took, who decided for which answer. Um, so it, Guts won't have the chance to um, discredit you on that one. Um, okay, so let's get started with a little bit of background. So the School of Modernization uh, was actually established in the post-World War II era in the U.S. It was a time where the U.S. was rising as a new superpower um, doing, uh, the, conducting the Marshall Plan in Europe and on the other side there was the United Communist Movement. In the middle you could say you had some third world rising nations um, in Latin America as well as in uh, the African continent. Um, just one little regard I would say third world nations in this presentation, even though it might be uh, a rather old term and today you would rather say probably developing countries, but I will use this term um, because it has been used in the literature, so um, just a note on that one. And uh, the School of Modernization uh, was established in the US because of um, of politics and because people wanted to understand and study third world nations in order to to understand in what way they were developing or um, okay so uh, non-industrialized countries uh, but so you will uh, hopefully be okay if I don't if I use third world nations just uh, in terms of referencing to the literature um, so the, the goal of School of Modernization was actually to publish papers and to uh, research social, social movements and political culture um, to avoid losing these countries to uh, the Soviet Union and the communist power because what you wanted to do is establish power all over the world. So in order to, um, to see how they were developing and to, in order to understand them better, this School of Modernization was uh, founded in the USA. And um, there are several theoretical foundations to the theory, which you also read about in the text. The first one, um, kind of, uh, I mean, they both had both had the goal to explain modernization, and uh, in the in, uh, and they were used to explain modernization in third world countries. The first one is called the evolutionary theory, and it's um, a theory that assumes that revolution helps to advance society. 
Uh, a revolution can be either an industrial revolution, um, such as the steam engine or the assembly line, but can also be a political advance that is, um, for instance, the French Revolution. So it's very much a European development-based kind of view. And it has three features. First of all, it says that <clears throat> modernization is unidirectional. So society moves on in one direction um, from primitive to advanced, and there's nothing in between, basically. So it's just it's very straight, and it doesn't go back as well. It's just one direction. Um, but also, it implies a certain value judgment on revolution, because it really forces revolution, and it pushes revolution, because it says, Revolution in the end is good because after after the revolution, the revolution itself might not actually be um, might not actually be great for society, but the last phase of the revolution is good because it will bring progress to the society. Um, but we have to consider that this is not a thing that can happen within a couple of weeks, but it's something that takes time that will take not only months and years but decades and centuries. The other concept the theory is founded on is the functionalist theory. Um, it is uh, one of the main representatives of this theory is uh, Talcott Parsons, and he's not actually a so social scientist but a biologist. So he very much compares society to a biological organism, and he has this principle of homeostatic equilibrium, which basically means that. For instance, the body has a way to regulate its temperature depending on the environment, whether it's hot or cold. But at the same time, society has a way to regulate itself. And just like the body, society has, a, has an interest, interest in maintaining itself. So institutions are not uh, in, in, in competition necessarily, but will work together, which is quite a strong assumption. And um, there are actually four critical functions of a society, which can be um, summarized with the term AGIL, A -G -I -L, um, which stands for, first of all, the adaptation to the environment, which is done by the economy, and also goal attainment, goal formulation by the government. Integration means the integration of several institutions and the working together of several institutions. And latency here means that you may maintain and conserve certain values of a generation and also uh, in, in terms of while it's changing you can conserve certain um, basic values within the family and within education. Um, also um, the functionalist theory has certain pattern variables. Uh, that means that they have certain characteristics you could say that helps you to distinguish between national and modern societies. And um, here we have effective, effective versus effective neutral. So in a, in a traditional society, you will have very close family ties, whereas in a, a modern society, you will also have very neutral relationship, for instance, within your work environment or within your education environment. Also, um, Usually, your social circle in the traditional society will be quite small, small whereas in um, the modern society, it gets bigger um, as institutions diversify and um, become more structurally differential. That w is what uh, particularistic versus universalist, uh, universalistic means. Um, also, the, the values and the, the orientation changes in that um, fa and usually in a traditional society you focus rather on families and you focus on your community, whereas in modern societies it's rather a self-orientation, a, a self-fulfillment that you concentrate on. And um, also functionalist theory assumes that whereas in traditional society certain roles are just ascribed to you, and you will have a certain role and a certain stance in society. In modern societies, it depends often on uh, what you actually achieve, what you can, what you do, rather than where you're born into. Um, also, and this is uh, important, that roles are not um, 
functionally diffused anymore. Like in a family, your father can be your father, it can be your educator, um, and it uh, can also be your boss. Whereas in a modern society, it would rather be that you have a father to be a father, you have a teacher in school, and then you have, um, for instance, a boss later at work. So you have a lot of more specific roles and um, the society um, is more um, differential. Um, now I would like to continue from the theories to actual approaches which developed from these theories and um, in the end build uh, modernization theory. Um, the first one I would like to introduce to you, which you have already read about in the text, is the sociological approach. And it, it really tries to explain what modernization actually is and, and why it occurs. Um, it was formulated, uh, this approach, by Levi in uh, 1967. And he says modernization uh, is the degree to which tools and inanimate, so non-alive, sources of power are utilized. Um, that means that you have basically modernized and non-modernized countries, but you cannot just divide them necessarily just in two groups. Um, but you can rather say, okay, it's a continuum, and countries will develop, and they will develop in this one direction only, from non-modernized to modernized. And as an example for a fully modernized um, country he uses, um, amongst others, the US and Japan and the UK. And countries which are on the other end of the continuum are, for instance, China and India, which is now interesting because today you would, even if you would apply the same scheme, considering uh, where they have arrived today, you would already see it a little bit that they have moved on the continuum, if you could say. Um, and also, what Levi stated, what uh, what was that, when non-modernized countries or non-modernized societies, um, here you can often use the terms synonymously because um, often when these uh, scientists talk about countries or societies, they actually talk about the development and the modernization of the nation state. So that's why I will use country and society. In, uh, as synonyms, so in this case, uh, this is what I will do, so don't be confused by my language. Um, yeah, but modernization occurs uh, often after contact of non-modernized with modernized countries, because then that is how they will actually see um, that there is a different lifestyle, for instance, that they could also accomplish. Um, in the text, there's the example that someone who will always, who just knows tap water and starts drinking uh, a soft drink will suddenly also want the soft drink and also everything that implies the soft drink, so all the development and all the modernization that comes with it, which is kind of a trigger point towards modernization. Um, there are also certain characteristics um, he distinguishes, which are very similar to the ones of, of the functionalist theory, so that's how you see also that these uh, that the functionalist theory is one of the one of the foundations of the um, modernization theory, um, because he says it's also a differentiation in specialization of organization, whereas in the modernized society there's a lot of specialization, there's not that much in the non-modernized, and also that the relation emphasis changes really from social ties to uh, being more open and having not that many uh, close uh, functional relationships. And from this he also gathers that because it's, um, because uh, the modernization happens on a continuum, um, he, he makes up advantages as well as disadvantages for latecomers to not modernization. For So for those countries which are not yet modernized, he says that those countries which are not yet modernized, on the one hand, profit from the expertise and from the knowledge of what to expect, um, what they have from already modernized societies. But at the same time, this might cause problems because of problems of scale, because they have to apply certain modernization um, characteristics much much faster and the 
the, the specialization of institution has to work right right away, whereas in the already modernized societies it grew naturally and therefore much slower, which might also cause disappointment then for the latecomers to modernization. There is also another sociological approach of Snelza in 1964, and he tries to explain rather the social disturbances in, uh, in third world countries, and he tries to explain um, it as a dysfunctionality of uh, institution working together and institution work institutions working together. He, he that's what he calls integration, and he says that in general and that also what we've heard before, that modernization involves structural differentiation. And um, if you take this, the institution of family, for instance, is divided into education, employer, and government. Um, but this also means that um, there is a change in um, institutions uh, which causes coordination problems. And co Coordination these, uh, coordinating these new institutions might lead to, to problems in between these institutions because um, they might not develop at the same pace and they might have different values. Um, and this, of course, might then again lead to certain unrest and violence within the society. Um, but and then the the true danger um, that modernization theorists saw in that was that because then societies which are in the process of modernization which um, face these social disturbances become unstable and then all of a sudden communism as an ideology might seem much more attractive. So that was an actual fear of um, the modernization theorists that this might actually cause them to rather follow a communist path than a capitalist path. Um, the other model I want to present to you, which I think is quite uh, interesting because it follows several phases, is the, the model of W. W. Rosso in 1964. Um, he tries to look on a modernization theory from an economic perspective, and he tries to explain how modernized societies grow self-sustainably, and he um, divides this modernization into different phases. And he uses the metaphor of airplanes to explain it, which I think, um, without judging the theory, it's just quite interesting to go along this because it makes the understanding, in a way, uh, easy. So to, in, in, to explain the five stages, I have uh, started started with a little kite, which stands for the traditional society, which is phase one. So this is the, the main beginning point of the, con of the continuum order of the phases, if you want. And it's a society where there are strong ties within the community, where there's limited material wealth, um, and also where there are strong ties to the past even, because there's a lot of worship of ancestry. Um, in the second phase, um, it's called the transitional society and in the text it was also called the preconditions for takeoff. This is a phase where cultural shift begins. Um, he also says it's a stronger focus on individualism, there's is an interest in, in, in establishing a market economy, there's this want of having material wealth. Here again you could connect this um, to what we have already heard um, of Levi that you have at some point somehow an interconnection between modernized and non-modernized society and that this somehow triggers this demand for more material wealth. And, and this leads to phase three. Oh no, sorry, I have to go back once more. Um, because to go from wanting the takeoff to actually go to the takeoff, he says that you need a certain stimulus. Um, so you need either, for instance, technological innovation or a political revolution in order to set off the takeoff and to kind of trigger it. Because just wanting it is not enough. There need to be some additional conditions. That's also why he calls the space precondition. Um, and the next one is called the takeoff. 
um, where he says, okay, there's still this very strong, um, strong focus on individualism and it grows stronger, which also refers back to um, what we have heard already about the social ties um, changing within the development, within the modernization in the sociological approach. There's now a real build on a market economy, there's entrepreneurship, there's still this want of material wealth and it's getting more established. Um, and um, it's also the growth becomes a norm. So it's no longer just an idea, but it becomes a policy, it becomes a, an ideology. And then uh, in the, tech, the, the phase four, in the technological maturity phase, um, we have on the one hand the weakened community ties but then economy also starts to diversify. So it, there's not just an economy, but it's, it's, it's diversifying, it's growing in different directions. There's urbanization, there are people moving to the city, to the jobs, to the industry. Um, there's a specialization in the workforce, with, which goes hand in hand with the diversified economy. Um, and there's public education. And then in the last phase, which is also then the phase which then continues on, because this is the last stage, uh, this is the, the, the last goal, basically, for modernization, is the high mass consumption, which is um, a growing natural income, a consumer society, certain welfare systems, so basically what we consider a capitalist society today, a developed trade. And um, Rosto used this model because he wanted to explain that a lot of um, pre-industrialized countries are actually stuck in this precondition uh, to take off phase. So they actually want to develop and they want to modernize, but somehow something is missing. And this something is usually capital, money. Um, and he proposed that in such cases it would be one uh, way to just give them money and give them expertise um, from another country in order to help them reach the next phase, basically. So that was what he was researching on. Uh, the last approach I would like to introduce to you is the political approach of Coleman of 1968, which is also um, quite similar to Smeltzer's, because he also talks about the differentiation of uh, political structure. He uh, talks about um, secularization of political culture, which means there's a certain stance towards equality, equality in the sense of equal citizenship, um, equal right to participation, um, and that these two aspects will actually enhance the capacity of a political system. And the goal of this was for him to say, um, how can you measure modernization in a political system? And he said basically, um, that modernization of um, a political system is measured by the extent to which it has successfully developed the capacity to cope with generic system development problems. So he says that in order to be a modernized political system, it needs to be able to cope with certain crises. For instance, national identity crisis, political legitimacy, a legitimacy crisis and participation crises. And that only if the political uh, system can handle um, certain shocks and problems, it will be able um, to, to, um, to be uh, stable and to be uh, modern and to, to grow and to diversify. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I just saw the comment. Yes, uh, of course, uh, the, the idea of Rosto, just one moment back again, was not to just give them the money for free and the expertise for free, um, but as a, uh, was a, uh, of course, a hint towards uh, that it's a debt, a foreign debt, and not just a gracious gift. Yeah, um, and, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and that was basically the political approach to say, okay, that um, he wanted to um, look at the modernization theory from a political perspective and uh, wanted to see what characteristics a political system should have 
in order to be considered a modern modernized system. So I mean you know probably most of this already because you've read the text. Um, I just wanted to go over it really quick and maybe you also gathered some new thoughts from hearing it again. And I would now like to summarize it and I want you to listen in really well because after this I want you to um, from what you read and what you now heard, I would like you to formulate points of critique that you see in this theory. And um, that's uh, now summarizing it can kind of give you some ideas on, on what might be faulty with the theory. So first, um, if we consider it from two perspectives, then we can say, okay, certain attributes of modernization can be attributed to the evolutionary theory and others to the functionless theory. Um, so modernization is a phase process. We've seen this in the Rostow model that there are different phases um, and that it's um, not just non-modernized to modernized countries. Um, we've also seen that it is a homogenizing process. So what this implicates is that basically there is one goal, which is the modernized society, the modernized country, and everybody is basically working to the same goal, which means um, that it will become uh, a more co a coherent uh, uh, group of people, a group of societies, because they are that are getting more similar with modernization. Um, also, modernization is in a way Europeanization or Americanization, um, because the the idea was to to look at how European countries have developed with industrial revolution, with technological revolution, uh, with uh, political revolution, and also America. Um, so this is kind of the, the format they are looking at. Modernization is also an irreversible process. Um, the idea behind this is that once the process of modernization has been started and once there's this certain um, uh, demand for modernization, it's difficult to take that back. Um, it's also a progressive pro uh, process because um, modernization promises to be um, increasing the health of people, increasing the lifestyles, increasing the economic um, development, so increasing um, the wealth, the personal wealth of people, therefore modernization in this theory is a progressive pro progress, a process, sorry. Um, but it is also a long process. So as we heard in the beginning, th this is nothing that comes overnight, but something that takes uh, decades or centuries. From a functionalist uh, perspective, we can say that it's a systematic process um, as um, you have already heard before uh, with the biologist approach, basically. And also, it's a transformative process because over the course of time, um, social ties, um, society, uh, and um, societal uh, interactions will somehow change. It's an imminent process, which means that if you change one part of society, other parts are likely to follow. This is also closely interconnected to the systematic process. Oops, okay, now I took something um, already from you. Um, because now this is just my short summary of what we heard so far. And now I would just very much like you to work in groups. But before that, maybe if there are any questions or comments, maybe we should work on those before. Okay. Yeah, uh, Deb, uh, can, do I have to activate yet? No, I think you can do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, no, you don't need to activate me. I can do this myself. Yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, I, I actually don't have much to add, uh, just uh, a few hints. Um, Atakit Parsons uh, is a sociologist. Uh, labeling him as a biologist would be an offense for 
the sociolog sociological community, he's, he's one of the key persons, but he refers strongly to biology, which is a unique feature in, in, um, in sociology. Uh, the evolutionary theory <coughs> as well um, is, uh, is based strongly on uh, Emil Durkheim. And as you are going to learn from future um, seminars, I think he's one of the key founders of the social sciences. So the evolutionary theory is, is, is a key part. Uh, what you're also going to learn maybe is from the Agil concept, which uh, Talcott Parsons introduced. This was uh, very well received by the modern human ecology and is quite influential until now in different variations. So it's worth remembering as it was outlined. And that what was said with regards to the homogenization, you may remember um, a reference to John Mayer, John Mayer's work polity as a structuralist approach in political science. Um, the reference from uh, John Mayer, uh, neo-institutionalist to uh, modernization theory is difficult to get, but here we see the homogenization is that what he could show uh, using the example from, uh, of institutions, that this is part of the process of what is called then modernization. Uh, yeah, but this was have just been some remarks. Uh, uh, Marike, just one question. Uh, the question and answer thing you didn't want to do now, you want to do after the group work or? Uh, uh, yeah, thank okay. you very much for the comments. Uh, no, I just refer to him as a biologist because it said so in the text, but uh, then apparently the text uh, is not correct either. Um, okay, so maybe um, we can go into groups now. And if there are other questions, comments, of course, uh, during the group work, please feel free um, to ask the questions. Um, in the group work, I would just like you um, to think of at least two points. Uh, that you find that are um, in the theory that are maybe faulty or where you think, okay, this, um, what it tries to explain, this modernization explanation is not complete or um, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And um, yes, if you need any help, just let me know because otherwise I would just put you into the groups now. Ah, Marike. Yeah, just just let me let me add here. Yeah, you are right. He was trained oh. as a biologist, um, but he was he became famous as a sociologist. So I was wrong, and you were you were um, right. Okay, so <laughs> I see that now I have too many working groups because I had one person in a working group doesn't make much sense. Okay, guts. How do I change this? Sorry, I'm I'm confused. Maybe yeah. I can just drag. No problem. I, I I will take I will take over. You you actually you actually go uh, there and uh, you delete okay. you delete some of them. So I just delete uh, working group. You have you have uh, yeah. distributed the people already. Hold on. I, I heard something like this. Really loudly and slowly. Okay. Yeah. Um, much better. So our most prominent points. I just stick to those. Um, is that the theories are all very centric and US-centric, um, meaning they all uh, present the idea that development, as they see it, can only go one way, which is towards democracy and capitalism, and that also this is desirable and is a process that is entered to voluntarily, uh, which ignores the um, Experiences of colonizations that were mostly painful and destructive for the countries and people that were colonized. Um, and yeah, that's basically the main ideas or main critiques. And also, um, sorry, also that uh, it seems okay. like it's selfish efforts, so they help the underdeveloped countries to develop, but that also includes exploitation of those non industrialized countries. it okay okay uh laura there was s still something you, you wanted to say i give you quickly microphone rights we are a little bit advanced at time but uh maybe due to the debate which we had in the beginning we we are going to hear out the the presentations to the end uh those which have to leave uh have to leave oh, okay 
So if Laura didn't want to add anything to this, then I'd say uh, let's continue with the next group and um, maybe you, if you uh, have pretty much the same ideas, uh, you can either um, just say that you had the same ideas or elaborate on some uh, possibly different ones. Um, I think uh, that would be great. So who of you wants to present? Ah, okay, Markus. Then I give you... Can you hear me? Uh, but now I can ah. Perfectly. Okay, uh, we have only one point because we uh, took a lot of time to, to write something down for us and uh, yeah, we uh, found uh, that uh, it's uh, it's really critical that, he's, that he argues in the evolution theory that um, um, development has something to do with mass consumption because uh, as the group before us was already saying as well, um, um, it, it is not necessary that you, that you have a lot of consumption or high uh, mass consumption to be a highly developed uh, country and we had the example that for example the county Bhutan, the Kingdom of Bhutan uses the happy index instead of the GDP index so uh, you can also measure weights with other indicators instead of um, GDP. Do you want to add something Anke? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just just one thing, uh, it's very important, the point, you should remember this. This is a crucial part also uh, when we look into other modernization or development theories, the way how you measure development is central and the way that you do it via GDP or rather GNP uh, nowadays is, is uh, essential. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, let's Michael. continue with the next group, uh, Julia and uh, Sebastian. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. We can. Okay, great. So, um, our critique points are um, that this theory is a linear theory. There's just one way straight and there's no way left or right with these phases one to five with the takeoff and the high mass consumption. And so, um, yeah, it's just a linear theory, straightforward, nothing else. And it's also uniforming human society. There's a duality between um, modern and primitive and that creates uh, inequality and injustice or, yeah. And it um, was also mentioned by the first group that modernization is not irreversible, like the Coca-Cola or Pepsi example. And then we also talked about uh, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, which is modernization via uh, violence and shocks. Um, that's a book. And um, yeah, it talks about um, yeah how violence like wars is used to implement liberal market reforms to implement the free market and um, yeah that's all I want to say if Julia wants to add something feel free Great, thank you. I think we, we got another point there. Um, I'm, I'm very, uh, I think it's great what you've done so far just as an um, in-betweener. Um, so maybe we just continue with the last group, uh, which is Kevin, Laura and Lisa. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> so our group um, had basically everything that was said. And we were just also thinking that a lot of the values of other society are devaluated within the 
different um, approaches of the modernization theory. And um, it said, you, you summarize it in the end, it, it said like this kind of togetherness or something like that, where everybody is working towards the same goal, but also within the times that the modernization theories were created, there were, for example, the 68er movement, which is like, uh, in this, like ki can be seen kind of as a counter-revolution, where people are um, not trying to uh, put their luck uh, onto capitalism and all of these values. And um, uh, yeah, like this end stage that everybody is talking about is kind of the big one goal to ha that has to be achieved to, to find happiness, but how can this be reached? And uh, as we all see today that all society, or that a lot of societies are trying to um, decouple uh, growth from um, environmental exploitation. It is, yeah, it's just not what growth or wealth means. That was all that probably hasn't been mentioned, but in other uh, presentations. Uh, great. Um, if anybody of the group wants to add something, um, because um, I think that's also um, like some some great points. Um, I think in general, um, you you, may, you mentioned a lot of great points. Um, for instance, that economic development is not necessarily equal to modernization. That it's uh, strongly based, and that there's a strong bias towards. American and European values um, that there's just a linear theory everything is linear there's no going back um, I will now um, put here my points of critique but you even had more points of critique uh, which I found great so my my suggestion would be that um, I will take the whiteboards and put them into the presentation as group work results um, I will just summarize them and then um, either upload or send you the presentation because I think what you figured out was just, um, it was great. Um, yeah, and uh, then also that uh, factors like colonialism and dependencies were not considered was another uh, important point that you mentioned as well. Um, then how, uh, what else, uh, I think those are hopefully the most important points. I don't want to repeat myself because we're already over the time. Um, my suggestion would be that I prepared a little quiz and I talked to Guts about it, that we will just quickly go over it the, in the next session, kind of as a reminder what we did in the last session. Um, and I will update the presentation regarding the critique. Um, because other than that, um, I would just say um, thank you for staying longer, For sorry for taking longer. Uh, I had some issues with the... With the uh, some technical issues, um, and um, I don't know if Guts wants to add anything, um, but from, from my side, that would be a big thank you to you for your great group work, and hopefully see you next next week. Yeah, I don't have much to add. Thank you very much, Mareike. This was really uh, a great presentation and a great session. Um, could be uh, a role model for, for further presentations. Um, I have only some little technical things uh, which I haven't expressed properly, pro uh, won't take long. First thing, I grade presentations you are doing and they influence the final grade if they are better than your term paper. Uh, so if you are uh, presenting very good, this uh, positively influences the final grade of the term paper. Um, secondly, I have um, created a playlist of on, on the YouTube channel, so uh, you can find uh, all recordings on the website uh, of the Environmental Justice Institute related to this course. And if you want to get the update by yourself, you can for sure somehow get um, the abo of this. Um, Lisa is going to present uh, in the next year on uh, theories of justice. 
Uh, I have received information by the library that the book of David Schmidt's Elements of Justice, as I've suggested, has been bought and put into the Handapparat at Marburg University. So I, I can just strongly recommend to have a look. Um, yeah, and this was it from my side. And once again, thank you to everyone giving the extra minutes. Uh, I think was worth it. Mareike, to you, thank you very much. I think we will have a short chat afterwards. And I hope you are going to have a great uh, weekend. I see you next week. <laughs>